David Icke and Ronald D. Moore effectively changed the scope of television when the reimagined Battlestar Galactica series debuted, first as a miniseries and then later as an ongoing series in 2003. The show was dark, miles away from the bright and sunny optimism of Star Trek, even though that series would influence this one. It was also, despite its relatively short run, an incredibly dense show with lots of history and thought working through every episode that was produced. There are many things that some fans never knew about this reimagined series. With that in mind, I'm Sean Ferrick for What Culture, and these are 10 mind blowing Battlestar Galactica facts you didn't know. 10. The Colony was not the Cylon homeworld. The finale of Battlestar Galactica involves a massive assault on the colony, a heavily fortified location where the Cylons retreated to after the first human Cylon war. It is located near a black hole with only one safe spot for jumping in and out, making it easily defensible and incredibly difficult to mount an attack against. Although this was flagged as the base of operations for the Cylons, Ronald D. Moore confirmed that this was not the homeworld. A Cylon homeworld could easily be an artificial construction like this, as they had left the 12 colonies to find a new home. However, for very simple reasons, the homeworld is not seen on screen in the entirety of the show. Moore felt that whatever the audience's imaginations would deliver would far outstrip the show's designs, due in large part to the budget. He felt that depicting the homeworld on screen would leave people feeling stale and there would be nothing they hadn't seen before. 9. Maelstrom caused a lot of drama. In the third season, Kara Thrace leaves Battlestar Galactica and there was a veritable storm both on and off screen over this. Initially, Katie Sakov was the only one informed of what would be happening in the plot, which caused mutinous moods on set. Upon reading the script, Ronald D. Moore revealed on his podcast for the episode that both Edward James Olmos and Mary McDonnell were deeply unhappy with the decision. They both went straight to him and demanded to know why this was happening. To save them from being a total outcry, Moore revealed the plan for Starbuck to them, which calmed them down. Sakov knew before anyone else about the return of Starbuck, but had to keep it a secret. That included keeping it from her publicist, as if she had been listed as unavailable for other jobs, there could have been someone who twigged it. Also, the final scene of this episode includes almost breaking down and breaking apart the model of a sailing ship we had seen him working on several times previously. This ship was a rental and the prop crew were horrified, thankfully it was insured. 8. A one-shot character wiped out most of the Cylons. Margaret Edmondson, aka Racetrack, played by Leah Cairns, was originally only supposed to be a one-and-done character on Battlestar Galactica. She was brought in to replace Crashdown, who in turn was brought in to replace Hilo. However, in her first episode, audiences reacted very positively to her, and she was kept in the series right through to the finale, when she nukes the Cylons. Accidentally. Over the course of the show, she goes from being the first human on screen to see inside of a base star, to guiding ships through the deadly cloud that surrounds the algae planet, to a mutineer by season 4. Her hatred and racism towards Cylons is extreme, although she does seem to accept Athena as one of their own. Though imprisoned for mutiny, she is released and allowed to serve on the mission to rescue Hera from the colony, a mission that gets her killed, though not before arming the nukes attached to her raptor. Collision with debris rattles the ship, her hand falls in the firing button, and from beyond the grave, Racetrack manages to cement her place in history. Not bad for someone who thought they were only in one script only. 7. Edward James almost said no aliens. Commander slash Admiral Adama is not Captain Kirk. He is a hard-boiled, weather-beaten man who would eat Captain Kirk for breakfast if he was so inclined. Edward James almost was approached for the role and he accepted with a condition. He was not a massive fan of science fiction, feeling he had already done what he needed to do with the genre back in Blade Runner, so he had it written into his contract that the show was to avoid cliches. The first four-eyed alien I see, he said, I'm gonna faint in front of the camera and you'll have to write me out of the show. Battlestar Galactica drew huge acclaim for its gritty realism in its approach to telling stories, and so, if this is in part thanks to Almost's insistence not to get silly, then we owe him a large out of thanks. 6. Star Trek is referred to a lot. Ronald D. Moore got his big break on Star Trek The Next Generation, and he managed to pay them back for this start by dropping several references to the long-running franchise throughout the run of Battlestar Galactica. The original Enterprise appears in a cameo in the miniseries as a member of the civilian fleet. There was also a Geminon transport ship with the registry 1701, a rather famous ship's registry number. Finally, on board the Galactica, there is a room that is designated 1701D, the registration of the Enterprise from the series that gave more history in the industry. It's nice to see a bit of loyalty in filmmaking. 5. Norse mythology plays a role. The universe of Battlestar Galactica tends to take influence from both the Roman gods and the Judeo-Christian god, yet there are allusions to Norse mythology throughout the show as well. In the miniseries, the fleet rendezvous at Ragnar Station, which is of course a reference to Ragnarok, the battle of the gods in Norse mythology. This comes just after the destruction of every world in the human system, a quite literal apocalypse. As well as Ragnar Station, Adama used to command the Battlestar Valkyrie 
Valkyrie, referring back to the female heroes of Norse mythology. 4. Galactica was a punishment for Adama. In the third season of Battlestar Galactica, Danny Bulldog Novacek returns, seemingly from the dead, escaping Cylon imprisonment. He is a former officer who served under Adama and Tai, though of course not all is as it seems. What is perhaps the biggest revelation in the episode has nothing to do with this soldier, but that Adama received command of Galactica as a punishment. While commanding the Battlestar Valkyrie, he was sent by the Admiralty to the Cylon Armistice border, where a stealth ship piloted by Bulldog was sent behind enemy lines, but almost immediately shot down. Adama was then forced to fire a missile at their own ship to ensure it would not be captured by the Cylons, fearing a reprisal. This came with consequences, and the more advanced Valkyrie was taken from him. There are numerous references throughout the show to Galactica being an older Battlestar that is ready for the scrap heap, though this was the first time it was explicitly stated that this was a deliberate choice. 3. Brian Singer almost revived the show before 9-11 Between 2000 and 2001, Brian Singer was working on bringing Battlestar Galactica back. This was following in the footsteps of Richard Hatch, who had played Apollo in the original series and would of course return to play Tom Zarek in the reimagined series, who had for years been trying to get the show back in some form. Singer's version would have seen it as a continuation of the original rather than the reimagining that we finally received. However, and somewhat ironically, the mood in America post 9-11 effectively killed the show as it decided there just wasn't a place for it at that time. Two years later, however, and the shadow of 9-11 hangs large over the reimagined series, with strong themes of religious fundamentalism, torture, terror attacks and militarism running throughout. 2. Messengers or angels. From the miniseries and right through to the finale, the question of what exactly the six who appears to Baltar is baffled people. Was she an angel, like she claimed? If that is so, then were the ones representing Baltar, Elosha, and Leoben all angels as well? Ronald D. Moore called them messengers instead. They were there to guide characters along the way, existing in a plane that was not the same as the humans in Cylons. This can be clearly seen in Maelstrom, where messenger Leoben speaks to Kara in the moments between life and death, and messenger Elosha, who speaks to Roslyn in the nil time space between FTL jumps. When awoken after being shot, Anders remembers his previous life in No Exit. He spoke about messengers that nobody else could see. He saw a woman where Tori Foster saw a man. The final line of the series finale has divided audiences, with some calling it a deus machina and others pointing out that it was the natural conclusion to the story. Whichever side of the argument you come down on, these messengers have a deeper and more complex position in the mythology of Battlestar Galactica than being simple hallucinations. One. Pegasus and the Legacy of Galactica The arrival of the Battlestar Pegasus in the second season changed the show utterly. Ronald D. Moore had wanted to visit this story, a retelling of the original series, The Living Legends, since the initial idea to update Galactica came along, but deliberately held off until the second season so that the audience would get a chance to care about the core characters first. Pegasus brings with it the history of militarism to Galactica, something which has, although it may not have felt like it, softened considerably since the first season. The choice to strip away the humanity of the Pegasus crew was a stark one, though it served to shock the audience again. Of all of the choices made in the depiction of the Pegasus crew, the character of Gina Invier was a direct reminder to the audience, harking back to Starbuck's treatment of Leoben in Flesh and Bone, and also a knowing nod. Her name, Gina, is a reference to G-I-N-O, or Galactica in name only, which the reimagined show had been called disparagingly by fans of the original. Everything about the introduction of this Battlestar was knowingly plotted to hit the audience as hard as possible. And that's our list. Let us know what you thought in the comments below. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. I have been Sean Ferrick. You can find me over on Twitter, at Sean Ferrick. You have been awesome, everyone. So say we all.